This video is brought to you by Exter. We all know that guy. A uh, plastic sleeve for your comb and a wallet for your money. <laughs> Exter is a company that was started by two Dutch college students who were sick of big and bulky bifold wallets. They wanted to reimagine what the wallet of the 21st century would look like, and the result was the world's smallest, slimmest, and smartest wallet. If James Bond carried a wallet, it would be this one. The company was nice enough to send me two models, one called the Parliament, which is made of environmentally certified premium leather, and a slim aluminum card holder. What I love about their wallets is that all of their models are outfitted with radio frequency identification protection to prevent thieves from skimming your card information. Not only that, but if you're like me, you probably waste a lot of time searching for your wallet around the house or even in your car. The Parliament holds up to 12 cards plus cash, and both wallets also have a strap on them for a few spare bills on the outside. With the Parliament, you can also add a tracking chip that is solar powered and that pairs with the Chipolo app to make sure you never lose your wallet again. My favorite feature of both wallets besides how slim they are is that with a simple click of a button on all their wallets you can easily access each of your cards. The aluminum card holder was my favorite of the two. I like the sleek look and the aluminum seems like it would be extra durable over time. Exter has a special promo coming up for their Father's Day sale. From May 10th to June 20th our audience will get 20% off site wide. If you spend over $150 or more you'll get 30% off plus a free gift bag. Shop with the link in the description box below. And now let's get to today's story. I had previously covered the Publius Enigma riddle that surrounded the release of Pink Floyd's 1994 album The Division Bell. The link is down below. But today I want to talk about Pink Floyd's late 80s concert that was broadcast all over the world and took down a government. Stay tuned for the full story. Pink Floyd would release the album A Momentary Lapse of Reason in 1987, their first album without Roger Waters, who had left the band several years prior. The album's making was marred by legal headaches over the name of the group, and eventually things would get worked out and the album would finally see a release. Despite mixed reviews from both critics and fans, the record was a huge success, going on to sell 10 million copies worldwide, and the band would embark on a worldwide tour to support the release. While Venice, Italy was somewhere the band wanted to play, it seemed impossible for the fact that there really wasn't a venue that could house the band and their thousands of fans. David Gilmour would recall to Classic Rock Magazine, initially Stephen O'Rourke, Pink Floyd's manager, was very against the idea of playing Venice, saying it would be too difficult. Throughout the second leg of that tour, he'd come up to me and say, it's never going to happen. I said, Steve, if Venice doesn't happen, you're fired, or something like that, he would say. The band would find themselves scheduled to play Venice on July 15th, 1989, where they were planning on playing a free show for fans to coincide with a holiday called the Feast of the Redeemer. The cost of the show was being picked up by Italian state-run television, who had the broadcast rights. The concert was originally set to take place in St. Mark's Square, but the residents of the city and some of their more conservative local politicians and bureaucrats were against it. Gilmore would tell Classic Rock magazine that the upheaval over the concert was merely political maneuvering saying there was a big row on the Venice Council. Some people there wanted to get others off and they used this issue to discredit them. We were political pawns he'd say. The Architects newspaper would write the following about why some locals and government officials were against the concert stating a number of the city's municipal administrators viewed the concert as an assault against Venice, something akin to a barbarian invasion of an urban space. Adding that the city's superintendent of cultural heritage vetoed the concert a few days before it was set to happen, with the paper writing, and I quote, on the grounds that the amplified sound would damage the mosaics of St. Mark's Basilica, while the whole piazza could very well sink under the weight of so many people. Eventually, a deal would be worked out where the band offered to reduce the volume of their concert from 100 decibels to 60 and play on a barge a few hundred meters from the square. The more liberal members of the city council who were in favor of the concert were quoted as saying that Venice must be open to new trends including rock music. The barge that the band would perform on was originally used to transport and service oil rigs. Drummer Nick Mason would tell Classic Rock how the local politicians who'd made life difficult for the band got their own barge for the concert and showed up right in front of the performance stage telling the magazine they got an official barge and decided to moor it right off the front of the stage. To the fury of the crowd, we were really rather pleased when the crowd took it upon themselves to start hurling whatever they could at the barge. It was very amusing. 
the waders assembled and used their trays as protection from the barrage. Then they found somewhere more suitable to moor. In the same interview, David Gilmore would add, as we finished, the council's own firework display started and the volume was 10 times anything that we put out. If anything caused a problem, it was that, he would say. The concert would be shown on Italian state-run television and would be broadcast in nearly 20 countries with 100 million people witnessing the show. It was estimated that 200,000 people descended on the city of Venice for the concert, while the city's 60,000 residents mostly left for the weekend, hoping to find the city intact when they came home. The concert for its part would end up being poorly organized and planned, as there were no portable washrooms set up or garbage bins, resulting in people going to the bathroom on statues and walls of buildings, and leaving behind 300 tons of garbage and another 500 cubic meters of empty cans and bottles. There was also some minor damage to a statue called the Judgment of Solomon, and beyond that, the crowd was actually reasonably well behaved. While residents of the city were livid with the fact that the concert went ahead, they also had other underlying grievances against their local politicians and government. The LA Times would write in 1989, Venice's greatest enemies are not frequent floods, polluted air, floating banks of seaweed, nor even the pigeons whose droppings corrode the marble palaces, but politicians at all levels who have been in charge of the historic city for the past 40 years. Decent housing is all but unavailable, administrative indecision has led to 12% drop in the resident population in recent years, young couples must move to the mainland to find living space. The paper would chalk up a bureaucracy that was rife with inefficiencies and corruption for creating the underlying resentment against the local government. Add to these grievances a Pink Floyd concert that was poorly organized, and it was no surprise what came next. Following the concert, Rome's mayor would tell the Washington Post, and I quote, this wasn't a cultural event, but a great commercial enterprise promoted by television and the record industry. Several days later, Venice's mayor, Antonio Casalati, echoed similar sentiments, pointing the finger at state-run television for pushing for the show to happen, as they stood to gain financially from broadcasting the concert. He would also tell Classic Rock Magazine that he wasn't present when the council voted to allow the concert to proceed, and that reneging on the show would have set up the city with a number of legal headaches. The residents at the public meeting didn't really care, and they called their local politicians and bureaucrats fools and scoundrels, adding, and I quote, resign, resign, you've turned Venice into a toilet. The blowback was so severe that city council and the mayor would have to step down as a result of the fallout from the concert. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Your Stories. Take care.